Hey, Last Looks crew. I'm back into working again, and I'm not going to lie, it's hard. I thought my brain was going to melt out of my ears a few times in the first week of prep. My brain was just so out of shape, like it hadn't had to juggle like that in months. And it took a moment to get back into a rhythm. So if you feel like that when you get back into the full swing of it, just know you are not the only one. And in saying that, guys, I will continue to try and release episodes on a regular basis. But as per usual, when I am working, this hobby of mine needs to take a back seat. So I apologize and I appreciate your understanding. Okay, let's talk all things wigs and wig makers. In this episode, Sam Cox of Samuel James Wigs shares his remarkable journey and insights into the world of wig making. From his early passion of animation to stumbling upon wig making through a YouTube video, Sam's self-taught approach and resourcefulness have shaped his unique path in the industry. His experiences from making wigs for college productions to working on film and TV projects offer a valuable perspective for aspiring wig makers. Sam's dedication to creating realistic and high quality wigs, along with his advocacy for proper recognition in the industry, make this episode a must listen for anyone interested in the art of wig making. And don't forget, applications are currently open for our mentoring with Last Looks. We have a wicked lineup of past guests that will be our mentors, and applications to be mentored close April 6th. All details can be found on the website last-looks.com or on our Instagram page at lastlooks.crew. Just look for the how to apply post and be sure to follow those instructions or you can listen to the mini-sode all about it. Also, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but you can listen to the show on YouTube. Look up the Last Looks podcast channel and subscribe. I want to take a moment to thank all all of our Last Looks crew that have bought the podcast a coffee or multiple coffees. I appreciate it so much and it really helps support this little beast of a podcast. It helps to pay for all the tech stuff so I can keep this going without paying out of pocket. So that is pretty cool. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Okay, enough of that. Let's kick into it. My name is Jamie Lee, a hairstylist working in film, and this is The Last Looks Podcast, a show where I catch up with hair and makeup artists working in the film industry around the world. And today, I'm chatting with wig maker Sam Cox of Samuel James Wigs. On with the show. And now, a word from our sponsor. Would you like to feel more confident working with textured hair? Do you want to learn techniques and tips for working on set with textured hair? If so, come and learn with AM Textured. AM Textured is co-founded by Emmy-winning hairstylist Amber Hamilton and Makeup and Hair Guild Award-winning hairstylist Marva Stokes. Two innovators blazing a path in textured hair education for stylists working on set. AM Textured offers comprehensive, hands-on training programs for individuals interested in learning about and working with textured hair. The Texture 101 course covers a wide range of topics and provides a well-rounded education for anyone looking to specialize in working with textured hair. The Braiding 101 course focuses on teaching different braiding techniques and troubleshooting, essential skills for anyone working with textured hair. Also, discover AM Textured's amazing hair products, Moisture Lock Hair Oil and Moisture Lock Leave-In Conditioner. You will want to stay in the know when it comes to their ongoing product development. AM Textured offers a valuable learning opportunity for stylists to expand their knowledge and skills with textured hair and braiding techniques. Enroll in courses and purchase products at amtextured.com. And be sure to follow on Instagram at am underscore textured today. And now, our feature presentation. Picture up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Sam. Hello. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay, so this is where our story begins. I want you to finish the sentence for me, okay? Okay. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Sam, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... Um, an animator, okay. I think, because I had multiple things I wanted to do, but I remember I wanted to do animation or something to do with that sort of thing, which is obviously quite different to wig making. <laughs> But animation, because you loved watching it for a start, I'm sure. I think sure. so. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I used to, you know, make like plasticine models and do all that sort of stuff. So that was a career I wanted to go into and then somehow fell into wigs. <laughs> so like you were doing like little stop motion plasticine yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I think just being creative, something creative. I knew it was going to be something like that. But Yeah. Yeah. But that's awesome that you were even like you thought about it and then actually tried it out as well. Just Yeah, I think I thought that was what was going to happen, tried it out and then realised that's not, that's not for me, something else. So, yeah, and then wig making came along how, after that. So how does, how does wig making come along and how old were you at that point? I was actually quite young when I started. Well, I taught myself wig making because um, I grew up in a very small town called Ilfracombe and not much going on there. It's a lovely seaside town, but, if, mm. you know, I realised if I wanted to do something, I had to try and sort of teach myself. So I taught myself wig making when I was about 15, 14, 15, because I remember seeing a behind the scenes video of something on YouTube. And this was before sort of social media was, you know, big with all you, there's so much you can see nowadays on yeah. social media with like wig making or, you know, makeup or anything to do with film and TV. Yeah. And I remember there was, well, one video and it was a how it's made video of this. I, I don't even know the wig maker. I don't even know who it is, but making a wig. And I thought that is really interesting and thought I'd give it a go and teach myself by pausing the video, seeing what he was doing, going, right, okay, I can see he's doing that. And then um, I was very lucky as a kid, we had an art room in my house because my mum's an artist. So we had a space where we could just sort of like do what we wanted to create things. And then, yeah, thought I'd give wig making a go using, using a piece of wedding dress netting and some really, really cheap hair and a, a hook that you used to do um, highlights with, you know, the, the like little crochet hook that you pull highlights through. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I thought I'd, I was like, this is, this, this is the closest I can think, thing I can find. And then just gave it a go. Oh I mean, I mean, it did take me about kind of like a year to really get, what I was and I was I was obviously doing it wrong as well and looking back at what I was doing it's all wrong but it was I think learning it that way through you know just myself and slowly I just developed my own way of doing it but um yeah I remember when I was um I think I must have been 16 I got a, a wig block for my birthday so that's how interested I was for my birthday you know <laughs> that's awesome I was going yeah. to ask like that you're looking at this YouTube video and trying mm. to figure it out and I'm thinking well, where did he get his supplies from so that's oh, yeah. very Innovative. Someone's poor wedding <laughs> wedding dress that I ripped up and stole the, the the netting. Oh my goodness! And then what hair? I mean, was it just family donating hair to you, or where were you finding this? It hair? wasn't. Even, no, it wasn't even real. It was it was um, really really cheap extensions. I think they cost about two pounds from a this shop. They were the worst plastic hair you could find, and I think you know working with the worst you can find is probably the best to start with because then anything after that is going to be easy. But, yeah, um, you're just gonna. It's just gonna appear easier and better, and you're gonna exactly, be like, "Wow, exactly. I'm really getting this." <laughs> yeah, definitely. Especially using using nothing that you know, so it basically falls apart as you do it. But I was, you know, I was determined. I was like, "I'm gonna make a wig out of this," and I did. And I still have that wig in a drawer somewhere. Oh my god! Never, I'm never gonna throw it away. I'm gonna keep it forever. Sam, you have to find it, and you have to send me a photo. I know. Of this. I don't. I want to see. I what don't it know looks where like. it is. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna say it looks terrible, but yeah, you know, but come on. It was, yeah. It was <laughs> my first go exactly and my poor my poor nan was always my um guinea pig of trying them on so i've got you have so many pictures of her with lots of random wigs on her head so oh my goodness yeah. so you got your first wig block what were you using before that before you got a wig block okay well <laughs> paper mache bit of paper mache a bit of bit of a newspaper yeah in the shape of a head and that was what i did i made a made a head out of newspaper wrapped oh it in cell tape you know paper mache it and make it on that that's amazing. Probably still got probably still got that somewhere as well. But, oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> Doing what? So I I, it's, I I knew it was something I wanted to do. So I was like trying to you know do whatever I can sort of. But like I said, this was before you could go on Instagram and Instagram pictures of wigs and find wig makers and see how people are doing it. So I just kind of had to make it up. 
Yeah. So, I mean, there must have been more than just that video that piqued your interest. I mean, was it, were you, did you have anything to do with any theater or just did you enjoy watching film and television and kind of starting to pay attention to wigs that way or? Yeah. So I, I mean, I, was, I think there's a lot of people who do lots of different aspects of what we do sort of started mm. at a little, a little stage school doing mm. dancing when I was, when I was a kid. So I was always in that world of theatre and I remember going to see one of my first shows I saw in London was Mary Poppins and yeah. she was on stage with her dark hair, beautifully dressed, dark hair. And I met her at stage door to get, her, to get my programme signed and she came out and she had blonde hair. And I remember thinking, wow, she was, she had dark hair on stage and it was so real. So I think that was something that sort of sparked my interest there going, oh, there's something happening here that I don't know about because, you know, no one, no one wakes up and says, I'm going to be a wig maker or... yeah sort of really understands that that career is there because it's such a hidden art form. Mm-hmm. So I think it was that. And then seeing a few behind the scenes things where they're maybe in the wig room or, you know, on set and going, oh, that's 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 not their hair. And I, and things like that, that, you know, that, that detailed and intricate always sort of uh, interested me. So I think that was what it started, what started it for me. Yeah, that's amazing. So at what point do you, so you get your, the, block first and then Mm -hmm. when does some decent lace and a a knotting hook and all of these things start coming into your world well i i went to college in devon as well and went to a performing i did performing arts course Mm. and they had a costume store there and i remember finding this one wig in a box and it was it must have been from i'm gonna say like the 60s but it was a properly fully made knotted wig and i was like oh this gold so I remember seeing like, the proper legs, seeing everything. So that was my first time I'd ever actually seen a wig that was that was fully properly made. And then from there, I was just googling where do I buy the stuff? Where because I had no idea where to. I didn't have any books on it, or anything. But then yeah. Ban- Banbury Postiche is a company here that sells all wig making supplies, and they were the first ones I found. And I was like, right, I need to save up my pocket money essentially and buy some lace and buy a proper hook. And I mean, it was it was a lot cheaper back then than the price of lace of what it is now. But I remember saving up for it mm. and buying this and like using every every inch of this lace to make something so i must have been around this must have been about 17 i started getting the proper materials and giving it a go and i was also making the wigs for my college productions oh, cool. i was buying cheap cheap hair or refronting cheap wigs and being like, i'll do all the wigs i'll do all the hair hmm. which i loved loved doing yeah so that was where i first sort of started actually i remember my first my first thing i made i think it was a mustache for a production we did and i was so proud of myself for like seeing this mustache on stage i thought like, oh this is this is great um I can imagine. And then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love too that it was so long after you kind of started trying to figure it all out that you even saw a wig in person. Oh no, absolutely. I remember seeing a picture on on the inset of a wig and the, the lace at the front, I didn't even know what the material I was like, is that plastic? What is that? What is that material? So trying to work that out. Wow. Um if I, a friend of mine who's a she's a theatre designer, she's retired now. She's called Danuta. She's amazing. I learned lots and lots from her. But she's from Poland, and she went to a school in Poland where you do. I think you you go from like ten till sort of seventeen, and you do your sort of normal studies like science, math, all that. But alongside mm. that, they do. I don't think the schools around anymore, but they used to do wig making, costume making, and lighting design whilst you're doing all your other studies. And then when wow. you get to sort of seventeen, you pick a subject you really enjoy. And I just remember thinking, if I'd had that when I was younger, I'd have absolutely loved that. So yeah. I think that's why, I like, just you know, trying to learn it myself was the best thing I could do, really. But um, yeah, it's pretty impressive. So, at any point, did you do any formal kind of education as far as wig making was concerned? No. So I I was still at college and did uh, work experience on the tour of Hairspray, the musical. Oh yeah. And I did a week's work experience. The head of department was a guy called David Burt, an amazing, amazing guy. And sort of, you know, stepping into a theatre, especially a show like Hairspray, where they've got 150 weeks in the show, I thought I was, I was in heaven. Yeah. It was the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. And um, he, he basically offered me a job straight after that in the West End. And I had to move. Um, this is a couple of months later. I remember him calling me up and like, here's a job for you as a wig assistant on this show. So... I never actually got into doing any sort of formal training in that sense and just jumped straight in and learned a lot on the jobs. But that wasn't wig making, that was more, you know, running in the department and styling wigs and things. So yeah, I actually, I've actually never had any, <laughs> any training in wig making or sort of wig dressing, but I feel like I learned quite a lot 
physically just doing it on on the jobs. Yeah. I mean, there's only so far that formal training kind of takes you anyway. I mean, you can do a whole year or two of, of something and still come out the end of it and go, okay, I've got the basics, but, and then you get into work and learn from experience and you're like oh my god I knew nothing (laughs) exactly and especially especially in wig making it's always changing it's it's um I always find every wig you do is the best wig you've done and you go oh that one that one's really good that's better than the last one because you've maybe done something slightly different or you know Mm. there's you never get to a point in in any sort of you know job where you go I'm I know exactly what it is now and that's it there's nothing else to learn so like you said you can sort of learn all the basics in something but then it's just years and years of perfecting it yeah, I mean, um, it would be so dull if you got to that point where you're like, I know everything. Exactly. I'd be like, okay, exactly. you should retire because actually you don't know everything, <laughs> and <laughs> you're obviously yeah, definitely you're obviously a bit bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so cool. So moving, working on the West End, mm-hmm. um, moving to London, and that's show after show, and just kind of working under different people or. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I moved up to London. I think I just turned eighteen. Moved up to London. I knew I always wanted to live in London because obviously that's where all the work is essentially. Mm-hmm. And got this job. It's called Let Me Attend. Beautiful nineteen thirties musical. So the hair was lovely. And again, the designer of this was that lady Danuta, who's talking about she amazing, amazing wig dresser and wig maker. Beautiful show, and it only lasted for two months. So I moved up to London, thought, this is it, I'm going to be working forever, and it's going to be amazing. And then we had our two weeks' notice closing the show, and I was just like, oh dear, what do I do now? So luckily, I got offered to go on tour with Sister Act. Awesome. So I went and did that, which was amazing. Toured the country, learn a lot when you're sort of, you know, living out of a suitcase for two years. Mm. And yeah, and just from that sort of did show, show after show, working my way up in the department. But alongside that, always doing wig making yeah so I was always making either out knotting for people this is where I'd started I, the first wig I out knotted was for wig specialities with Richard Morby who ran that company mm-hmm. and I remember doing my first front for them and just so nervous seeing it but that was where the sort of out knotting started so I was always doing kind of trying to balance the both of being in a department on a show and then also wig making because I knew I kind of loved both because right. they don't really go you don't you don't need to do both you know if you're sort of working in this industry but I loved that I could do that alongside it all. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it kind of goes to show how much you wanted to do it, that you weren't kind of sidetracked fully by just styling and applying. Yeah. And also, I, but making wigs, I could practice the styling I was doing for the shows on those wigs I was making. So it was like a sort of helped out in that way as well. Yeah. To be able to see it from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you must learn a lot doing it that way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when a wig is made and you're making it to physically dress into a style, you can do it. So you go, I'm going to make it this way and it's going to specifically dress in this sort of, like you can make it do what you want it to essentially. But um, yeah, I love love doing it, touring my little wig making kit around the country with me. (laughs) That's awesome. So at what point do you start thinking that you might start your business? Well, the business kind of came out of nowhere, essentially. Well, not not really out of nowhere, but I... <laughs> so I'd worked on quite a few shows. I think I've been doing the West End, sort of touring, doing different productions for about 10 years at this point. Mm. And I'd got to the point where I was head of department, which I loved doing as well. I loved working theatre. But again, like I said, I was always wig making on the side. Yeah. And I'd finished a job that I'd just done for a year in town. Had a really good time. And I'd just made my first kind of film wig for a... TV production and I had had all my stuff essentially in my bedroom Mm. where I was living and I was like do you know what I can't do it all and I can't wake up and see these heads and hair and you know pins in the carpet everywhere so I had to get a a space so (laughs) and there are plenty of times I'd stepped out my bed and stood straight on a pin and I'm sure you know the feeling of like a pin going through your foot it's the worst thing ever so I was like right (laughs) this is it I need to I need to get a space so I found a really small little studio space and it kind of just from that I didn't do another theatre show. I didn't take on another sort of department, running department. It just, lots of wig making just happened very quickly. And and that's where the business was like, oh God, so this now needs to be a business. Right. And since then I haven't worked on a show since. So it's just gone from there, really. Yeah. So I guess just past clients and any interactions you'd had just kind of, they'd get hold of you and be like, can you do this for me? And it just continued. 
So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you remember at all when you did your first wig for a television production, kind of going into it differently than you would for theatre or? Yes. So I'd been making a lot of wigs for theatre and I I can't remember if I'd done anything. I'd been making a few things on HG Lace, just experimenting and trying things mm-hmm. out. And then this uh, Erica Opvis, who was designing the Rook, they came to me and said, oh, we'd love to make one of these wigs for us. So made a couple of wigs for this TV program. And obviously it was a brand new experience for me going into going on set and, and doing it. It was very different essentially from, you know, being in theatre. Yeah. So straight away I was like, oh God, I need to learn how, how people sort of behave in this environment compared mm. to theatre. And again, with the wigs, you know, making something that's for camera. So trying to learn very quickly what I needed to do. And, and that came from a lot of seeing other wigs and I used to like study if I, if I found someone's like a company I knew made this wig and I found it I'd study that wig and how have they made this bit how have they done this right and then sort of applying it to what I was doing so yeah for that first film project I probably did a million things wrong I wouldn't do now but it was a good sort of learning curve you know jumping in and just like, getting on with it really yeah and so what do you do now do you do a bit of everything you're still making wigs for theatre and film and tv yes yeah, so there's a few, few of us now in the studio that we've got um me charlie lottie and justin we all work in the studio and i've got a lot of out knockers as well so mm-hmm. basically moved from that very small studio to a bigger one now got a really nice place at london bridge <laughs> and i've kind of like tried to hold on to theatre as well because it's where i started and i still really love it so i've very very luckily I've been designing shows in the past couple of years which has been amazing oh cool and then throughout that period as well the wig making for film and tv really took off and it's just been like a lot and it's been amazing so trying to balance both of them has been difficult but mm-hmm. i've really enjoyed being able to kind of do both um, and meeting lots of people in the film and TV world that I'd never have met, you know, just staying in theatre, yeah. uh, meeting amazing designers and amazing artists. So that's that's been amazing. That's very cool. And I know this is always a hard thing for people to answer because it's hard to choose favourites, but I'm going to ask anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> can you think <laughs> of maybe like top three favourite projects that you've worked on and why it can be for any reason? So we did a Diana film, Spencer, that came out a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. Wackana, Yoshihara was the designer, came to me and was like, would you want to make this wig for the Diana wig? And I was like, love to do that because I love doing things that are real people, you know, something you're really trying to replicate, something that's already you know, real. Yeah, and it's Princess Diana. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, <laughs> Princess Diana, so absolutely. So I had the opportunity to do that, which was really great. Made a couple of wigs for that film. Um, we did, did a queen for it. We did Prince Charles, which was a really good collaboration because it was part prosthetics, part wig, or p- half punched, half wig, and finding the right hair for that was great. And I think it, it looks great what we did, and mm. I was really happy with that one. And just recently did hundred or a lot of the uh, wigs for Hunger Games, which was great because love the franchise, love the film. So being asked to do the Hunger Games was like, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, it's so cool because it's it's like, I guess, uh, a lot of us, well, I thought those that that world had come and gone, like we weren't going to be absolutely. revisiting that again. So that's yeah, awesome to have that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And then last year or the year before, I can't remember, it's all sort of <laughs> bending into one now, but we uh, <laughs> got asked to do... So a lot of the wigs for the Wicked film. Oh, cool. So that was very cool. And I love the fact that that was, you know, from theatre where I sort of started. So it's a mm. nice sort of combination of both. It felt. But we did some really cool wigs for that. Um, so I'm very excited to see that come out. Oh, I think everybody so, is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They've got to wait a long time, yeah. <laughs> Who was designing that? Wicked. Yeah. Francis Cannon. Oh, amazing. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. I absolutely love her. Yeah. Um, done a few things with her now and just she's so amazing and what's really nice with Frances is that she'll she'll ask what I think as well rather than just coming saying we need this wig made this is the colour make it she'll mm-hmm. say to me what do you think what, sh- what should we do here which is really nice for us in the studio to sort of get creative with it and not just sort of make a product box it up send it off yeah you know, got a bit more of a like have a, a bit more creative with it which is great so that's why I love love working with her and she's very very talented and everyone you know everyone who works with her says she's the best so yeah that's amazing i mean legend jesus (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome that it's so collaborative for you. That's great. I yeah. just, I, I wonder too, because I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it's stating the obvious, but you are 
still very young, right, to so. be doing. I don't what, feel. I don't feel it. I'm sure you don't, because no. I mean, you started this. You know, <laughs> you've been doing it for a while. As I, I understand yes, that, no. but also there are a lot of designers out there that do have, you know, however many years. In front of you with a wealth of experience. Absolutely. Do you ever come up against any issues with that? Obviously, not with Francis. That sounds like an incredible relationship, but just especially, I guess, I don't know. Interesting question. Um, <laughs> yes, I. Do you know what? Initially, theatre, since when I left working on shows, running the departments, and then wanted to kind of get in the design side of theatre, yeah. that was harder to crack with my age, sort right. of like being, oh, you're you're a bit young. And yes, I know I was very young when I started. And mm. I think my first my first head of department role on a show, I was 21. Right. And at the time, I'm, I remember being like, oh, I, I can do this. And then looking back, I was like, I have no idea what I was doing. But you know, gave it a go and hopefully it went okay. But then, so theatre, crack, going into theatre, doing design to theatre was harder. Mm. People people are a bit, not wary, but a bit more like, oh, we don't really know you. We don't, you know, we've not used you. But then film and TV was the complete opposite. It was just, I felt like a lot of people were just coming to us going, oh, you're new. What do you do? Let's use you, which was really, really good for us and amazing. Because I, you know, it's like, I thought I'd be like, oh, people won't use us. We're very new. I'm obviously younger. But I think, I do think it's kind of gone in my favour. Mm. Um, and I know there's lots of designers who are very, very loyal to, especially their wig makers. You know, they, they find their wig maker they like and they'll always use them. Yeah. Um, and luckily we've had that start with us now. And it's it's amazing that we've got people that come back again and again for different projects. But no, I feel like, I do feel like being, because I've had the business now for maybe four or five years. Mm -hmm. And I think being newer, a lots of people are like, oh, that's fun. That's interesting. Let's, let's try you because you're something. Yeah. something new I guess that's good I like to hear that I mean and when I say that <laughs> I guess in the grand scheme of things you are young because people in our industry seem to work for a long time oh you absolutely. know we go past into where we should be retiring and just kind of mm -hmm. keep trucking because we love it so much so and I'm assuming yeah. you know that goes for wig makers as well like it's just everyone just keeps on trucking so in yeah. the the timeline of things you you are still very young <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think I think it's also because you know like you said we love what we do and it's yeah. an amazing it's an amazing career that's never the same you know every day is completely different you're not going in doing the same thing again and again mm. so I guess you're like that is why people you know hold on to it as long as they can and yeah Hopefully, I will too, and keep doing this for a real time. <laughs> it's awesome. And uh, thinking back, and this is like me asking you who your favourite child is, but what so far has been an all-time kind of like favourite wig that you remember creating that you just kind of from start to finish were just like, I highly love this wig? Definitely some of the stuff we've done on Wicked, mm -hmm. um, which... I don't know if anything's been released yet. I don't know what's been released, but um, probably not. It's um, probably safer to probably, <laughs> probably yeah. When does it but come did, out? Uh, next Christmas, twenty twenty five. Oh, okay. The well, first. This will play the before. first film. This will play before, and then me, so. yeah, okay. And the next film is like two years after that, I think. Oh. We did a week for Emma Corrin in Lady Chatterley's Lover. Oh yeah, uh, which I loved because. It, the designer was Denise Coombe. is amazing. Love working with her. She's really, really cool. And um, again, is sort of similar to Francis and such. Like, what do you think we should do? What, what, what hair should we use? You know. Mm. And I found this hair that was really, really long, really like natural, lovely curl to it, and a beautiful color. It was all natural, sort of, you know, that natural sort of ombre that just happens when hair has been exposed to sort of sun and weather over time. Yeah. And we made this wig that had we essentially point knotted the hairline with all these short soft curls um so you could just twist it up and it would have all this lovely hair at the front that would just fall down and that was one of my favorite ones i think the color that we used and doing that one from you know start to finish and then we went to the screening and i was like yeah very very happy with that so that was that was one of my favorites i think yeah it was beautiful i remember thank you i remember seeing it and being yeah just and then she was running around in the rain as well and yeah so yeah it was great just that, that as you were saying before, just the realism, yeah. being able to create that is, I mean, and that's, yeah. That's what I love. I love doing things that are supposed to be very real. I'm, I'm, I love doing all sorts of things, but when it's like, oh, this is going to be a, you know, wacky thing, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm more interested in making it very real as if you have no idea it was there. That's, that's obviously the goal with, with making. I love doing that. Yeah. I mean, I would assume it's far more of a challenge. Like I always speak along those lines of, 
because I think there's <laughs> when it comes to hair and then when it comes to makeup and you know you talk to makeup artists and especially those that kind of do um, special effects and things like that and for them the realism like being able to just simply Mm -hmm. put a nose on someone can be so much more challenging than a full alien makeup because it's Mm -hmm. that mimicking of nature that everybody knows and sees every day that can be so much more challenging to get right Mm. and to not be able to notice it and just see it seamlessly blend in and I'm always saying that that it's just like well with a wig that's the same thing you're having to create nature I mean you have the hair Mm -hmm. there already of course but it's everything else that goes into it so Mm. I understand that it's um I mean you obviously enjoy a challenge so yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's all it's all trickery you know making wigs all trickery of making it do a natural head of hair mm. um the same as like dressing you know dressing a wig or dressing someone's hair it's so much so much easier to dress a big period style rather than go right this needs to be dirty as if they've not done their hair that's the, that's the hardest stuff to do mm-hmm. which is always the more interesting stuff mm. the more real and sort of gritty stuff but yeah and that's that's what i think with like with dressing a wig oh how do i put this it's like a uh it is an object that you have to manipulate. It's not just going to do, not just going to be put on someone and go, there we go, it's done, gorgeous, it looks like hair. Yeah. It's that you really have to put it in and do all those sort of little, little bits of, and everyone has a different way of doing it. And that's what I love seeing with different designers, seeing how they sort of play with a wig or what they do to it to trick the eye, like you said, to making it look as real as possible. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, that's the fun bit of it. Yeah, because, I mean, you can put everything into that wig when you make it. You can give it the growth direction, this little baby hairs, the crown, all Mm -hmm. these types of things. But then if you have a hairstylist grab it and think that it just is going to be ready out of the bag, Mm -hmm. I guess that's where the trickiness comes Oh, definitely. (laughs) You can can do the best wig. You can make the best wig in the world, and depending on who's handling it, it can... You, can, you know, look like a shop bought wig, or you can do the opposite. You can make a shop bought wig look absolutely amazing if you know what you're doing with it. And that's that's one of the hard things is kind of letting go of some of the, like, the wigs we've made and going right now. Someone else has to you know look after it. Yeah. And like you said, we can we can spend all the time doing a beautiful crown, spend days doing that, and then if someone just brushes straight over it, it's gone. And <laughs> you know that, yeah. And you're like, Why did oh, I bother? All that hard, honestly, <laughs> all that hard work, or they just part it in a completely different direction. Oh, brilliant! That's it. That's that gone. <laughs> Um, uh, I love how yeah. you you just said that all so nicely. I'm always just like simply, you can make a, a fantastic wig look shit and you can make a shit wig look great. <laughs> so <laughs> This is true. This is true. I have I have kind of learned, I remember when I first started, I was kind of like, oh, say nothing, send it off. But I've kind of learned now I have to kind of go, right, okay, we've made it like this. Mm. It has to be dressed like this mm-hmm. before you do whatever you're doing to it, make sure it's done this. Mm-hmm. Then you'll get the best out of the wig, you know. Yeah. Because we know exactly what we've put into it, the directions we've done. Mm-hmm. I'd always try to explain, so this grows like this and then dress it into what you're doing otherwise you know yeah it can look very shit yeah. which is really sad to see you know i've had a few things where i've gone oh let's pretend we didn't even make that wig because right. that doesn't look good <laughs> yeah and i think too that it's like uh, i would imagine this may happen to wig makers at times that they have somebody new come come to them have a wig made and this person's come to them because they've seen other wigs that you've made that have been dressed beautifully and presented incredibly well on screen. And this person's come along and been like, oh, well, I want a wig from them. But then Mm -hmm. they don't dress it well. And all of a Mm -hmm. sudden it's the wig maker's fault. Yeah, absolutely. Or why you made them a nice wig. What's up with this shit wig that you've given Mm -hmm. me? It doesn't look as good as that one. And it's just like, well, there's a, it's the wig's only half done. Like it's being made and created but you still have to finish it (laughs) exactly exactly you know and that does happen exactly like people you know think you can sort of shake it out of the bag and it's done but it's Mm -hmm. not it's there's so much work into it before you even put a roller in it you need to put all the work into that wig and that's like i said we're trying to explain all that now and be like right you need to dress the crown in let that dry you know wet all that in i i would spend ages wet the wig down pin it all in different directions with the crown and let it dry in that and then once it's dry, then dress, then put a roller in it or, you know, do what you're going to do to it rather than just brushing it straight away. Because, you know, we put all the, all the directions of the hair, the way we knot the hair is all 
trying to mimic the way a person's head of hair sits. But you know, we're we're not. If you punch into skin or like silicon, your that hair that you punch in is going to stay in that direction. Whereas with a wig, it can flip in obviously other directions. So we try and mm. be like, you need to wet it, dry it in that direction that we've made it in, and then yeah, do what you're going to do to it. That's so great that you take the time to. I mean, it's worth it to um mm-hmm. to educate in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. More of that, I say. <laughs> it's also awesome. not not everyone wants to hear it though. That's no, I'm sure. So, you know, I'm I'm yeah. abs- I have no doubt. I was just going to say it's so easy to blame the object that's in front of you rather mm. than like you know asking. Well, how did you do this, and what 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 can we do to make it do this? You know, mm. or it's it's also having that conversation before the wig's made. If you if you'll make, you make know, you need something made and you need it very specific, mm. we'll make it in a way that it does that rather than saying this is a standard wig and now you're trying to do something with it that. It's not going to do. You can't fight with hair and you can't fight with a wig. Mm. It's going to do what it wants to do. You have to go with it. So that's something that would definitely help when head of departments and designers are communicating with you at the very beginning, like is a bit more of yeah. a detailed consultation, I suppose, of what they're really yeah. needing. Absolutely. Mm. And then all, you know, designers, department heads, all, everyone's different. Everyone has very different some people are very, very, want to be very, very involved from the very beginning. You know, some people are like, this is the color, that's the wig. Can you make that? And we do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's great when, because the studio we've got is um, sort of central London. It's really good when we have people come in and pick out colors of hair. We look at different colors or bring bring the actor or the actress in and we'll try, you know, hold up hair to the head and see what works for them rather than just going, it needs to be brown, make it in this. Then you put it on and you go, oh, actually, that doesn't quite work with that person. So right. it's, it's nice that we can have people come in and we have a, quite a large stock of hair and just go through all of that. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the hair, mm. all about the quality of hair. That's, you know, if the hair's not good, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. I, I know for myself that when I have something made and at any point if I'm having trouble with it, the first person I'm calling is my wig maker to be like, mm-hmm. what can I do? Like, what am I doing yeah. wrong? Pretty much. Mm-hmm. It's just, I never, I would never turn back around and go, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's more like, I must be doing something wrong. And it's just like troubleshooting, even just over the phone with them to be like, yeah. well, I'm trying it this way, but it's just not, you know, and it might be something that they adjust slightly for me because maybe it isn't something that we spoke about in that initial yeah. consultation so or they'll be like oh maybe try this and then i'll try it i'll be like oh, that's totally mm. it that works that's amazing so just being able to have that open dialogue i think with your wig maker is so important yeah. and don't and just rush immediately to blame something yeah. or and, someone and some <laughs> sometimes it's 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 as little as like three hairs need to be put in the hairline and that changes mm. everything yeah you know sometimes it's that small or sometimes it's quite a big adjustment but you know, it's the same as like a, it's a costume fitting as well. There's so many back and forths with it. And mm. we've done some wigs where we've gone back and forth, done doing tiny, tiny alterations here and there. And then mm. finally get to that end product. It's very rarely it's you finish it and that's perfect done. You know, there's always something minor, very small. So that's why we always try and do fittings with the, the actor, the actress, you know, bring them in and we can look at it and go, right, for us, this fits well. And then, then send it off and also do that fitting with, the department head or the designer, you know, coming in so we can see it all together. Yeah. Um, and then any alterations that need to be done. And then but yeah, definitely just talking to the wig maker and saying, how yeah. did you, how did you put this hair in? And then go, oh, it's, it's done in this, this direction. And then you go, oh, okay, so that makes sense. Like I'm going to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I think like when I do, cause I take wig workshops every now and again and I've seen, I'd love to come and do one. <laughs> I would love to come over know. and do one. I don't know if we'd be teaching you anything, Sam. No, but- <laughs> I've seen words, you would. But I, it's so funny that, cause we do a, just a natural set and then we do a yeah. wet roller set. And mm-hmm. it's funny how many people are asking me about, you know, uh, putting the roller in and I'm like, listen, I'm not yeah. here to teach you how to do a roller set. I'm here to yeah. teach you how to set the root of this wick. Mm-hmm. I don't care Absolutely. how that roller goes in. You need to figure that shit out by yourself. Like that's <laughs> that is something as a hairstylist you probably should have maybe learned at some point about how yeah. a roller goes in. <laughs> and yeah. that's like I don't care about the length of the hair. We're not going to be wasting time on that today. Just get the rollers in. But all I care about is that root direction and that's what mm-hmm. we're 
focusing on today. And it takes some people a minute to just be like, what? But it's all the same yeah. thing. Like, and it's to say, no, a, a wig is not a head of hair, like on someone's yep. head. We need to, there's two different sets going on here. There's the roller that you're putting in and the ends and the mid lengths and everything. And then, then there's like the root and the knots of what's happening down there. And it, it can take people a little minute sometimes. And people who have been doing this for like 20 years and they're just like, what? Mm-hmm. I never thought about it like that. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh, I'm incredibly glad I could tell you that today. <laughs> <laughs> and they, oh. it's it's so fun that they just be like they're like this is a game changer oh my god yeah I can't wait to you know do this at work this is amazing and it's like yay yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's all the little things even just like brushing a parting forward and dressing and then dressing it you know instead mm. of brushing a lot of wigs you see now on some films mm. the partings will be just straight back and mm-hmm. it just no one's hair grows that way and no one's hair sits like that so it's mm-hmm. just. I think, and uh, you probably have the same thing, and I know a lot of wig makers do the same thing. I'll be walking down the street, and all I do is stare at people's hair. I'm stood behind someone on the train, mm. I'm staring at their crown, going, "How is their crown doing that? Which way? That's or oh, their hair grows in that, and everyone's hair grows in a different direction." Mm. But yeah, staring, and that's I think that's the best thing about being able to dress a wig in, in the sense of like the roots and everything is actually just staring at people's own hair and really studying what people's hair does, rather than going, "This wig is a wig. I'm just going to put." rollers in like you said rollers in it and dress it out and pop it on done yeah it's that it's like you said there's two sets it's a very good way of putting it there's, there's two sets in that that wig i think i i do send my students away <laughs> they probably turn into like little stalkers at the supermarket and stuff like that because i'm just like just next time you're standing in line at the supermarket like really pay attention to hair growth yeah. patterns like at yeah. the temples you know is a massive yeah. like uh, for me and it's through the there seems to be a especially with period wigs sometimes that through the middle and the front it just goes straight but it's a very drag wig feeling yeah. like that wave yeah, it's yeah. like a surf mm-hmm. wave that kind of happens mm-hmm. and it's just like really hard and strong yeah. back and that's that's one of my pet peeves i'm just going to be honest yeah. but what when you're watching stuff on on tv or film like what normally sticks out to you to go oh uh, that could be better if they didn't do that like what what do you see yeah. that what stands out to you i think definitely the the parting going being brushed straight back and dressed mm. back it's like you know mm. like i said I, I love sort of brushing it all forward completely wet mm. letting it dry like that and then manipulating it to do what you do so it's that um it's the density mm. of partings as well not being able to see through a parting or not seeing any skin mm. i was just watching something recently and i thought like, there is not an ounce of skin between that line that is the thickest parting no one's hair grows like that or if it does you're very very lucky with lots of hair well they're just um coloring in their scalp or something exactly exactly <laughs> and you said it already as well but temples when temples are too thick mm. that is the i think that's the biggest game changer in a wig is if there's too much hair in a temple then you've, you, you've lost it. You can have all the hair at the back, but if you, even having, making a thick wig, if you make the thickest wig, if you do the really fine temples, mm. everything's going to look, look good. And I, that's one of the struggles we kind of come up against sometimes is with um, some people being like, oh, it has to be super thick to cover the hairline completely. But I'm like, you know, you need to sort of, you need to block out those temples of that, that person, get rid of their, their own color underneath. And then mm. if you've got a really fine, thin temple going over the top, it's going to look amazing. You need to be able to see through it. You need to be able to see through that bit, see through the path thing. I think a lot, a lot of people think you're getting a wig. It has to be thick, glamorous and like, you know, mm. but you know, most of the time, a lot of people's hair is, you know, can be very thin. And I think as another thing I find as well is, especially when you're, if you're buying hair, that's raw hair cut mm. from someone's head, mm. majority of the time, it's going to be cut from say like, just below their chin and the color difference from that to where their root is mm. is so different yeah and then if you use that cut bit of hair and not that into the wig you're essentially using the color from halfway down their hair strand yeah as the root and if that sort of part of the hair is going to be have grown out and changed color and you need to put that color back into the root to mimic that root shape because I, I i like to root shade even the darkest wigs i've always put something into it to change that because otherwise it just makes everything look very flat so i think that's one of the biggest giveaways as well especially around the hairline when it's just like one solid color yeah like well 
Wig. No. Wig. I, yeah. <laughs> I love a root shadow. My my thing with temples is, well, yeah, thickness would definitely draw my eye, but when it when it just goes straight back, mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. There's very few you people at, on the planet whose temples just grow straight no. back. Lots of people see it changes. It goes forward, then back, then down, forward again. It's all different directions. <laughs> it's mimicking all of that. But then again, like we said, we can we can put that in. And then if someone tries to just brush it straight back, it's going to split in weird directions mm. and not going to look good. But <laughs> I think as well, it's also the sort of the thickness of hair because we buy hair and draw it off into length. So you're essentially pulling pulling all the strands out and sorting them into lengths so you can mm. have a bundle of all 16 inches, say, then a bundle of all 12. But people's own hair breaks, grows in lots of different directions. So we say to like sort of either if you like razor the hair off, make, you know, put imperfections into it. No one's hair is perfect. Mm. Um, so it's doing that as well, putting in, putting imperfections into, into a wig mm. to not make it look like, but then, Another problem is you'll have some actors being like, I want to have the most glamorous hair. And you're like, you're playing a dying, you know, your character's dying, but you want to have the most gorgeous hair in the world. It's, that doesn't add up. That doesn't yeah. work. No one has every single hair on their head all exactly the same length. Exactly the same length, yeah. <laughs> gorgeous with like, a gorgeous curl at the end. Unless you're Barbie, yeah. maybe. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> even even she has some layers and things going on. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> But um, just to go back a little second, I just want to make sure, was there anything else that you would love for anyone coming to a wig maker to understand when communicating with you guys? I know it's not always this person's fault, but it's time, obviously. It's right. So, you know, time is the, the more time you can give, the better mm. for us because the more time we have with that object, the more time you've got to do alterations and do all these things to it. Recently, and I think this is something that's come out of COVID mm. as well. It's just finding that, and it's again, it's not the not the designer's fault, but it's in production. But being like, oh, we've we've now only got a week to make this wig, and this person's on camera next Tuesday. You're like, brilliant, okay, yeah, it's because rough. it's you know, from that fitting, we're potentially not starting that day. We've then got to find the hair, got to find the correct, you know, all the correct hair. Have make sure we've got enough hair. And, and like I said, I know it's not easy. It's easier said than done, but it's just having as much time as you can. Yeah. And another thing that I always try and <laughs> try and find out is, do you want a second wig made exactly the same? Because a lot of the time we'll make something mm. a couple of months later, we'd love another one made exactly the same. And I'm like, oh, if you'd have just told me at the beginning, we could have made all the hair together from the same, you know, the same batch. Right. It's so much harder to try and recreate that hair again when you've done it you know months previous so yeah and the wig's already you, gone if, and out of sight exactly and, <laughs> and we're like well i d- i don't even know what that wig looks like anymore <laughs> so if, if you can say like yeah we're gonna definitely have two great we can we can get all that hair together and we can even make them at the same time so we know we're doing the same highlights or you know low lights or mm. trying to yeah you know, make it exactly the same so that's that's another thing that's always hard to do i think i'm the, um, I'm the nightmare client because i'm always doing last minute <laughs> shit but it, it, it's never but I, it's not through my i don't plan this stuff it's no, just like no. guys you gotta make a decision like fucking hurry yeah. up it's, it's casting as well yeah oh my god oh yeah, it is so incredibly stressful when yeah. you start something and you're oh, just the casting. Like casting as you're shooting as well, like just nightmarish. But I always, the first thing I always say is to say, well, you need to make a decision on this sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. You guys seem to be very worried about your budget and the longer, yeah. you know, the shorter time to make this wig, the more expensive it's going to get. So you should probably yeah. hustle and tell me what you want so we can get it done. <laughs> I think it's, I think the, the the other problem as well is that we always manage to do it. You know, we'll manage to make the wig. You'll manage to get all your stuff together. And we'll manage to get them on camera. Mm. So production was go. Oh well, you did it. Regardless of how much time you did, we you know we can give you six months or two days, and you still managed to do it. Mm. And I feel like until someone goes, no, we're not doing it. That's it. You we're not, not going to do it. It's not going to. They're not going to change. But yeah, that's always the you know. I mean, I did that with. I mean, I, well, I normally give people a deadline of just like I need to know by this date but they normally just do yeah. not they ignore me um and I'll remind them like we need to you know it takes us long and they're like mm, whatever but the only director who really really stuck to that was Damien Chazelle for Babylon for Margot's wigs oh, and amazing. because he was so you know it was a big thing to kind of narrow down for what he wanted like it was a lot of testing and a lot of trying different stuff and a lot of conversation Mm -hmm. and watching things back and all that type of stuff and 
but I'd given him a date. And I had mm-hmm. almost forgotten the date, but he kept reminding me, he's just like, you know, and it got closer and closer. So I know that I need to tell you by Thursday. You will know by Thursday. I know that, you know, it needs to happen by this date. And I was just, I was so proud of him for really paying attention yeah. and sticking to that. And he did. I mean, it was, you know, the last hour of the day on that day of him going, okay, that we're going with this. And I was just like, okay, great. Yeah. And then in that time, of course, I had prepped as much as I could, you know, got the the pattern and the measurements and the photos yeah. and all that type of stuff and kept They're ready to go straight kept away. So we make it kind of up to date of we might be going in this yeah. direction. I think we've got the color nailed down. We're probably looking at this kind of texture, but I'm not sure about yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, yeah, very, very proud more, of him. More directors. For, yeah, yeah. More directors like him. Yeah. I think that's the other thing is like a lot of directors are scared of wigs as well. Oh yeah, and I think if they've had, you know, if they've had one bad experience, mm. that that's it. Don't like wigs. Well, yeah, I mean, um, they they experience it themselves, or they watch stuff that they're like, "What the fuck is that?" Yeah. So I yeah. can completely understand the fear. And like, it comes down to time. You know, if you've got that time to alter things and test things and go, "This doesn't actually work," rather than going, "The first time we're ever going to see this wig is the first day they're filming." And that's when you know it's like the stress. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so at the, <laughs> one of the last things I worked on, I was. <laughs> The actress, she didn't want to colour her hair, fair enough, you know, or cut it or have heat used on it every day, all this type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So she's just like, I want a wig. And I could, uh, of course, director, producer, they're just like, oh, we would rather use her own hair. And it's just like, yeah, well, I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. And I just naturally, because I'm always going in with that, you know, trying to gain like get that trust of like it's going to be okay well, yes we're going to mm-hmm. be using a wig but please just trust me for a minute it's you know it's, what you're doing it's going to be okay i i hope it's going yeah. to be okay but i'm pretty sure it's going to be okay so just guys um but these guys they could feel that i think i was like trying to sell them on that it's going to be all right guys and the producer at one point turned around he's just like we don't have a fear of wigs and i almost felt like going well you should <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, it, was, it was funny that my brain went in that direction, whereas normally I'm yeah. going, no, no, you you should be, you know, you trust. Wigs yeah, can be yeah, good, yeah. but uh, the table's completely turned. And in my mind, I'm like, well, maybe you should have a little fear of wigs because they yeah, can. Absolutely. When wigs go bad, you know. It's just like, wigs go bad, like, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Great. I'll just um, go ahead with what I'm doing then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I was going to ask you because – we had kind of touched on this briefly when we were um, communicating before this, but I wanted to know, are you always credited for your work on films? Like when it comes to the actual credits of the film, because I know that you can put stuff on IMDb like and it's uncredited, but how does how's that been working for you? Because I know a lot of times wig makers will just be, I guess, forgotten. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've actually ever been like formally credited on a film or anything TV film yet, I don't think. You mean in so, the yeah, actual we, credits? Yeah, but, but anywhere. So I, I, and I think it's because we're seen as suppliers rather than we're not right. contracted to a production. You know, right. you have your costume makers that work on site who are obviously all credited, but because we're not working on site, we're not seen as part of the production, which is, you know, it's, it is a shame, especially when you go and see something or see something, a wig we've made and you watch mm. the film and you go, that person's head and hair and face is 95% of that film. Mm. So that's all you're looking at is that mm. wig. And mm. that, that can be quite disheartening when you're seeing that and you're going, you know, you're not getting any sort of, yeah, the credits, you know, rolling credits or anything. But, um, you know, and I have seen a few people get credited for a few things, which is so good. So I'm really, it, it, all, it all comes down to production, whether they want to do it or not. Um, mm. But yeah, it's that thing of, you know, we're just seen as supplier. Right, um, which is a shame, you know. Yeah. I would, it would be nice to, you know, have a have a credit, but it's it's something we're trying to, you know, sort of get changed. And I know there's a f- quite a few designs I'm working with now who are like really pushing for it and be like, we have to have this. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to the the um, production's been like, no, which yeah, definitely is a shame. Yeah, um, I think. It, know, it- um, do you think like is it is it when you're trying to have Samuel James wigs? written or if it was purely your name do you think it would be different because mm-hmm. i know for me and i 
cottoned onto it a little bit late and I, a million apologies Rob Pickens but I <laughs> and, and for everyone else actually who I remember when we did Don't Worry Darling and I saw the credits and they fucked them up in the makeup and the hair departments mm-hmm. and I was just like walked out sending a billion apology texts to everybody going oh my god I can't believe they got this all so wrong but now I'm just like getting, you know, get to the end of a production. I'm just like, okay, who do I need to speak to to make sure my credits are correct and that everybody that I would like to be on it is going to be on it? Like, who am I having that conversation Mm -hmm. with? Mm -hmm. And just making sure that that conversation happens. Even though that can happen and those things can get passed on to studio and post, it can still go terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. But just making sure that I do that. But in saying that, because Rob has, you know, his name, but then he has Wigmaker mm-hmm. Associates. But I've never yeah. credited, like, asked them to put Wigmaker Associates because I don't, I don't actually know if they would, right? Because it is a company yes. name, yeah, I suppose, yeah. as you're as you're saying. So, because I think a makeup designer had that trouble recently that she was wanting to put the special effects like shop the guy's name who owns the shop but then his shop name next to his name like you know this person from the store this effects shop and yeah the studio wouldn't let that happen they would only put his name and i was just Mm -hmm. like oh okay well at least that happens but i was just like oh what who does it matter (laughs) yeah yeah. Um, exactly but i think it definitely definitely helps to at least yeah. yeah to have your name in there because also then if you were wanting to add you to some type of award situation as well if your name is in the credits then they're more likely to agree to that as well mm-hmm. God, awards <laughs> well yeah because um, it, it, I think if you're on the on the random occasion that that may happen and I did that with. Rob on blonde, yeah. and I, you know, you, I had to petition um, for the Guild Awards when we were submitting, and we got nominated. But I pretty much in the petition, I think my petition writing, I had like I don't know, a hundred words I was allowed to write or something, and I think it was just like one sentence. It was pretty much if I didn't have the blonde wigs that Rob made, there would have been no Marilyn or blonde. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just like that's <laughs> as simple yeah. as that. Like without, yeah, yeah. yeah that work that wouldn't have existed and they allowed that to go through but in saying that he technically wasn't in the credits yeah but my petition i guess was strong enough to be like well without that it wouldn't have happened yeah so so good um i think it yeah i I think it also comes down to like our department as a whole hair and makeup it's just always the the art thought Mm. um and same same in theater as well um, and it's even seeing like going to see something and like a designer, hair and makeup designer, not having the, you know, at the end when they have the, or even the beginning when you have the uh, the credits, but it's just a single name. What's that called? What's the oh opening credits? Name? Is it uh, something? Like, but it, and there's a name if you've got a, a standalone oh. the screen with just your name on it. You mean if you're fancy? If you're above, yeah, if you're above fancy. The line. But you know, you have <laughs> you have you know costume designer, production mm-hmm. designer, and so many times they just completely miss off. A makeup designer and they put them right at the end at the bottom and it's like no they should have their own their own screen as well they're you know part of that lead creative team yeah um but we find it a lot in theater as well where we've got our um like the tony awards or the olivier awards for for productions mm. and they there are there is no award for hair and makeup design right um so you're like so okay well big... go do your show without it and see how exactly and, you <laughs> how know, you get on <laughs> that's yeah I'm, sh- I'm sure they'd notice very quickly when you know Someone doesn't have any wig on or the right hair or even, you know, look at a show like Wicked. If she did, if she was, she wasn't painted green. Yeah. That's or hairspray that you stuff. started with. Imagine exactly. There was no- <laughs> exactly. So that's the, but they, it was a really interesting, there's, a, there's an awards, it's not the Olivier Awards, it's a smaller one here in the oh. UK. And there was a category for best costume design for a musical. And I think there were maybe six or seven musicals in that category. And one of my shows was part of them. Uh, with Gabby Slade, who's the costume designer, amazing costume designer. Mm. And then for one of the shows, it was costume designer and wig designer credited together for this one show, rightly so. And uh, we went to them and said, oh, it's, it's amazing that you're doing this for this one one show, but what about the six, five, six other shows that are 
in the same category, would you, is it not good to include the wig, the wig designers for each one of them? And they came back saying, oh no, we just don't think any of those warrant, you know, credit for their, for the work for those shows. We're like, oh, that's lovely to hear. That's really, really nice. Um, you, you've done that really well. It's like, it's, it's just silly, you know, and it, we are always the last thought of a production, you know, mm. but the first one, if it's wrong, you know, it's the one that stands out as well, the most, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, especially with a period piece with the hair oh, silhouette. Absolutely. It's just like, come on now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, well, I hope we can slowly make a change there. That'd be I good. I think so. I think it is. And yeah. And I think it's not even, it's, it's, you know, it's like credit every, everyone who's been a part of this production and part of this to make this final thing. It's, you know, um, it's a collaboration. And yeah, maybe it will change. Fingers crossed. We'll just keep trucking. Yeah. Keep we'll keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I haven't. I didn't. I don't know about the my name or the company name. I don't know what's been put down before. So I'll definitely find out and see if that does change anything. Yeah, it might be uh, even if it was Samuel James, but didn't have wigs mm-hmm. on the end yeah. of it. it they might. Yeah. It might be a little more credit friendly. Yeah. Yeah. But then, and also, I feel like I, there's there's so many people in my. Mm. workshop legally work for me that I'm like, I kind of want all of it. like I feel like if it's just my name it's like I've just done the work where it's like as a company we are a, that's our whole company doing that <laughs> one step at a time Sam <laughs> I know I'm, I know <laughs> like I've everyone everyone credited <laughs> I think when it yeah I know yeah that's tricky I know yeah yeah I think like I hope when people see Rob's name in things that it that it is assumed that it is his yes. his company and yeah. his team yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I and completely understand. he does such amazing work as well like his wigs are everywhere so it's great um so when you are talking about your team so when you are building a team like what are you what are you looking for in people to work with when it comes to do you guys call it ventilating or knotting? Because I always knotting. call it knotting. Yeah. yeah, okay. Over here, it's, it's yeah. like they call it ventilating. I know. I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, well, what does that mean? Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you're li- um, literally tying a knot. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's what it says on the tin. I think it's looking for people who have patience. You have to have a lot of patience to make a wig. Mm-hmm. And people who want it, there's so many people who come to me and say, I really want to learn. I'd love to do it. And I'm like, I'm sure you would until you actually sit and do it. Mm -hmm. And then once, you know, there's a lot of people sit and do it and go, oh, I had no idea it was this much work, but, you know, this level of detail, which can put a lot of people off. So I think it's, if you've got the patience, that's the first biggest, you know, biggest thing you need. I'm just curious. Um, I'm just going to stop you right there. I'm mm -hmm. curious about these people that think this because did they never look at a wig, like really Mm -hmm. look at it and go, how was this made? Because obviously to me if i look at something like that <laughs> the I, yeah. time and attention to detail like slaps yeah. me in the face so and it's the same thing as like look, looking at a costume isn't it and looking at going i guess some people go oh that's probably just bought from you know for the shots but right, right. it's seeing how much detail is and work has gone into that mm-hmm. the current studio we're in we've got our fitting area right next to where we sit and actually make the wigs and we found it's been really good a lot of people who come in especially actors mm. who have no idea how it's you know they've never seen the process they sit in their chair they get the wig put on them they get it taken off they've, they've not seen the process of what actually happens so mm. having actors come in and look over and go oh is this how you actually do it and then lots of people have come and sat with us and gone, oh, can I just sit and watch? And I think it's really good for them to see that. And they then they actually get, they're like, no, I had no idea the amount of work that goes into this. Some people have sat and said, can I have a go? And we've, you know, given them, they're not encouraging them, have a go. And they've then realised, whoa, this is hard work. Uh, but I think it's that, it's, you know, seeing the process of something and actually realising what goes into it rather than just the finished product plonked on their head and they have then none the wiser. Yeah, um, I think it. Yeah, I mean, it, it does help. I think when an actor understands what has gone into that wig, just even if it means yeah. for them to respect it a little bit more, so yeah. there's not the pulling and the grabbing and the exactly the scratching pulling that one the, hair out, the this and the that, and you're like, ah, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> it's like yeah. you, you can touch the hair and all that kind of stuff. Like I want you to own it and like live in it and be it be be one with it, but. Oh my God! What are you doing? Trying yeah. to pull the whole thing forward on your head right now? Oh, um, <laughs> yank, yank, just yanking on the legs as well, and like, oh, that's ripped! Brilliant. 
<laughs> I had, and I, I regretted um, working with an actress. No, no, I didn't regret working with her, but it was her, <laughs> her first time wearing wigs, and I didn't go through all of that with her and Mm -hmm. uh, midway through shooting I noticed that she would get like when she had a you know full-on scene or something was happening she would start scratching oh god she would scratch the lace that had been laid down like glued down like she'd be scratching at that and it's just like I kind of felt like oh god it's it's kind of too late now to Educate her on this. Uh, Could you please should have not do it. that? Yeah, should have done it at the beginning. You can't go in when they're like in the middle of their work, you know, and be like, um, can you stop doing that, please? <laughs> just mid-scene. Yeah, but it's just like trying to set yourself up for success at the beginning of the introduction of the wig. Like, look at it. Oh, yeah. wait, isn't it beautiful? It's all hand, like every single hair has been hand knotted mm. onto this lace. And the la- look at the lace, it's so beautiful and delicate. Like that's how it's going to, you know, like disappear into the skin when we glue yeah. it down because it's so delicate. You know, it's just going to... <laughs> But I, it's amazing. I think some people think they're indestructible as well, and you can just pull them around, and they're just gonna, you know, last forever. But they're really not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've had that a few times. That's it. I've had a few times where I've plucked a hair out, and people have been like, "Oh, you can't do that," and I'm like, "Yes, but I can put it back in. You can't." <laughs> That's the difference. Good point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, so patience is definitely what you're looking for. Patience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I like people being able to go, oh, why don't we try this? And thinking something different to what I do and go, do you know what? Yeah, actually, that's, that, that would work. Mm. Um, so people have got their own initiative to it as well. And just understanding, like, I don't know, understanding the, like, colour and what, what, what would look nice and what goes together well. And But, yeah, definitely having their own initiative and things and patience. That is, yeah, yeah, patience. There are days when I want to throw the wigs out the window and just be like, that's it, never touching one ever again. Oh, we all then, go through that, you know, Sam. I'm oh, pretty sure. Don't worry gosh. about it. <laughs> it's like a love-hate but we relationship love, but we love sometimes. Them, yeah. <laughs> but I just, I just love that they don't speak back to you. That's the nice thing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure you speak to them. Well, I know I do. I, I get busted talking yeah. to wigs all the time. I'll be like, listen here. Absolutely. <laughs> Do this. This is how it's going to go, all right? If this relationship's going to work. (laughs) You're going to dress out well today. You're going to sit well and look good. Yeah, behave. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So uh, does that kind of flow into what advice you would give someone that's looking into getting into wig banking? Yes. I mean, like I touched on this earlier, like we're so lucky now. We've got all these social media platforms that have so much information about wigs you can books as well there's a lot a lot of new books about wig baking now but you mm. can go online you can go on instagram you can type in wigs or follow designers or follow wig makers and people are very generous with their their sort of knowledge and you know there was i think there was a time when it was very hidden you don't show anyone anything and it's all very like oh no you can't you can't see how we do this but yeah. people are very generous um i've spoken to a few few people like stacy butterworth i've spoken to her quite a few times when i was mm. first starting and she was so generous with her information of her process and so i sort of like you know, lap that up and listen to every word she said. So I think it's, it's speaking to a lot of people. If you're starting, you know, it's, it's chatting to, I think as well, as wig makers, every wig maker makes the wigs different. Mm. Every company just has their own way they do foundations, the way they knot the hair, their process to the hair as well. So I think that's, that's something I especially did was try and see as many different wigs from as many different wig makers and go, oh, I love the way they've done that. Or, mm. oh, I'm not too sure about what they've done there, but sort of, piecing together bits of everyone's work and I think that's amazing how they've done that so I'm going to try and you know, steal that not essentially steal that idea but you know go I could I could apply that to what we're doing and yeah you can go on Instagram you can see all these pictures of wigs online and see oh that's interesting how they've done that so that there's that sort of doing the research and looking into that and speaking to as many people and you know coming in, if people are offering work experience something and you know sitting with wig, wig makers and just trying things out Especially yeah. seeing if it's for you, because a lot, of, like I said, a lot of people go, I really want to do this. I think one of the things a lot of people do is they buy all the equipment, mm. they give it a go, and then they go, oh, actually, this isn't for me. And I've now got a whole set of wig making tools and blocks and things, and I've just realized this actually isn't for me. So it's, if you can give it a go with, at a studio and um, go and do work for it somewhere, try it out, and then do that. That's the... That's the best thing. Yeah. But again, s- studying, if you if you can get your hands on a wig, studying how they've done it. And that's the best. Because I remember the first, like I said, the first one I had going, oh, it's actually amazing to see that because that's completely not what I did when I was trying to make it myself. Right. But also practice as well. Sitting, 
if we're t- if I'm teaching someone, mm. I will show them the basics of how to do the knot, how to do that. But everyone everyone holds the hook differently. Everyone holds the hair differently, and it's finding your own way of doing that. And then I say, now you need to go off and you need to sit for hours by yourself just mm. until you get the process and get the the rhythm of it. And once that clicks, once you've got that that's when you need to start, you can start learning all the other things like directions and, you know, different types of knotting. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of practice, you know, just like anything. Got to keep it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Repetition. Yeah. Build that muscle memory. Yeah. And definitely going like thinking about just all the wonderful films that you've watched in your life. Um, mm-hmm. is this, is there one that you remember watching and just being absolutely blown away by the hair and makeup, whether it was just, uh, you thought it was beautiful, inspirational, anything? Yeah, I think also not realising it until I'd got older, mm. but it was definitely Lord of the Rings, that whole series, mm. obviously with Peter King and Peter Owen. Mm. Having no, seeing them when I was younger, having no idea about hair and makeup essentially, and then coming back to them later on going, wow, when you rewatch them, you go, those wigs are amazing. Mm. that was definitely seeing the, that series for me was I think as well because the way everything's done in that film is in those films is just so natural you know nothing's too dressed too we need to have a million braids here and make it look like this it's just very it's just hair which I think is the most amazing thing so yeah seeing the work on those films because you did The Hobbit as well didn't you yeah <laughs> yeah amazing as well it's the it's that that series of films is just I think for me was the like yeah that's that's what I want to yeah, I mean, there's a of. there's a lot to look at. I mean, there's a lot going yeah, absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah, to be inspired by, to be intrigued by. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And what one tool or product would you never want to be without? Oh, well, obviously my nothing hook. Yeah. I've got one <laughs> nothing like, hook. I can probably answer this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd say, I'd say there's definitely, it's two. It's a nothing hook and a tail cone. Mm-hmm. I feel like. For two for, for for my different jobs, so say like for wig making, obviously my knotting hook, and I've got one knotting hook that when that breaks, I'm going to give up because I can't do it with any other. <laughs> for some reason, it's just the best one, and and I know it's going to break at some point. And the day it does, I'm going to go right. That's it, done. Go to someone else. So um, just yeah. that one, like, but you have yeah. backups that are the same brand, like the same. Yeah, type? I, I mean, there's there's the, <laughs> the hook up, the hook we started using. Over the last couple of years, it's called the German type, and Chrissy sells them from the wig department, and they're the best hooks. There, I, I love them. They've s- apparently stopped making the large size of them, which was really sad. <laughs> um, so the the one the, the the hook that's in my the holder I've got now is a a large one, and I I love it. It's, I don't know for some reason it's, when, when you get a new hook and you start using it, you you essentially kind of like break it in, Mm. in a way. The first times you use it, it's like, oh, that's really, doesn't feel right. And then it starts to like break in to to just work very well. So yeah, when that goes, that's going to be a very sad day. But um, I think for like the theatre sort of designing dressing side is just a a pin tail comb, rat tail comb, whatever, you know, tail comb. I I feel like I can do, if you've got one of them, you can do anything, Mm. you know. I lost, you know, that. Yeah, they're the best. So (laughs) definitely those two. That's awesome. And one person you'd like to hear on the podcast? Oh, I've said this to you before as well. I'd love to hear from Peter Owen. I'd love to hear his story. It's not going to happen. I know. I I know. (laughs) Makes me so sad. I know. um, During lockdown, like during COVID, I got very close oh. and then he was just like you know what I, I can't do this and then I circled back around maybe maybe six or eight months ago just to be like are you sure yeah and um they were just like oh I don't we don't think he's into it I'm like oh yeah god oh, yeah shame. I so desperately I, I, would love to speak to him so yeah yeah I just love to hear his story and how mm-hmm. how you know, his history of it, which would be amazing. Yeah. But if not, I think, I definitely think you should talk to Wakana Ushihara as well. Yes. She's amazing. You know what? I just, I was Love her. watching um, Haunting in Venice the other night and I was yeah. just like, oh my goodness, I need to, yep, need yeah. to chat, need to chat. She's she's so amazing, so lovely and so talented. I've I, We did a fitting for when we were doing the Spencer film and I've never seen anyone set up their place so beautifully. Mm. And I was like, oh God, I am such a mess compared to you. And it was just amazing to see. And she she cut this dye in her hair in about, I'd say she did in about five minutes, five, ten minutes, cut, 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 blow dry done. And I was like, wow, you've literally just created magic in about five, ten minutes. Wow. And she's so, so 
yeah, so if you can chat to her, that would be, I, I can't actually fully know her sort of like work history. So it would be really interesting. You know what? It's amazing how many people's work history I don't know. Oh, I, yeah. I, you know, I when I interviewed um, PK, when I interviewed Peter King or Rick Finlay mm-hmm. or just uh, so many people. I mean, I, I spoke to, did one with Heba Thorisotta, who I'm v- very good friends with. There just the other night and I was just like, I don't know half this shit about your life yeah. or career. Like it's just not something you tend to sit down and go, Well, tell me your story. Like yeah. you just yeah. <laughs> naturally don't tend to do that. Like bits and pieces of stories will kind of, you know, come into conversation, but to actually really sit down and listen to somebody's journey, it's yeah. it's just so funny how long you can know somebody on a work with them and not know all those things. So yeah, that would be cool. It's, yeah. And I, I'd spoken to Rob Pickens about this because when I heard his podcast you did with him, I was like, mm. God, that is so similar to my story. Like mm-hmm. we have, and I spoke to him and saying that we had the same, weirdly, very similar experience going into this. <laughs> I and love this. <laughs> yeah, just he was just on the other side of the other side of the world. So. Yeah, but I would just say it's so amazing to see like how people fall into it in such different ways. Yeah. Absolutely. With you and Rob, it's so funny because I, I i don't know if you probably heard me call him, refer to him as Doogie Hauser on, um, <laughs> which is <laughs> probably not the most respectable name to give somebody. But it was just like, how you, you know, you just so young getting into it and all that type of stuff. And then I, when I came across you on social media, like in my mind, I was just like, oh, they've got to be arch nemesis. Like they can't. <laughs> they, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just like, of course they're not. Stop thinking, you know, turning everything into a comic book. Um, <laughs> maybe we, sh- maybe we should be. I might. I'll, mess- like, I'll message him. And be like, <laughs> they're so yeah. similar. They must be enemies. No. <laughs> yeah, we hate each other. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I but- do think that is that is one of the things of this industry. Is there's so much of that where people are like, oh, I don't like that person because they do the same job. But I'm like, we're all doing the same job. There's enough work to go around for everyone. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Just I try and be try and be nice, try and be friendly with yeah. everyone and let's work together. Yeah. It's so much easier. Exactly. <laughs> it is easier, isn't it? Yeah. So much easier. <laughs> um yeah. and before we wrap, are you ready for a quick fire round of questions in thirty seconds? Oh God, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. No, no. Okay. <laughs> are you ready? I think so. What is your favorite period? Oh, thirties. What's your star sign? Uh, Capricorn. Do you believe in aliens? Yes. Have you seen one? Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite hair colour? Oh, red. Do you hit the snooze button, yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Do you watch more TV or movies? Uh, oh, wow. What did you answer? I'm going to say movies. Okay. <laughs> I wish I could say movies, but it's bloody TV. It used to be movies. Mm. Ugh, I need to. I need oh, to te- switch it all back again. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible. I, I can't. I, if there's a long series, I just can't. Even if I love it, I really struggle to get into things. But it's good. It's good. We sit and watch films when we're nothing. Oh, well. nice. That's awesome. Especially films we've already seen because you don't have to concentrate. So just yeah. Put, oh, sorry. A film we've already yeah. Film we've yeah. already seen. So just put that on. Listen yeah. to it. God, that was stressful. <laughs> I had to really think about my my star sign. Then I was like, what am I? <laughs> that's so random I love it well thank you so much this has been thank you. so much fun and I'm so glad we can make it happen thank you so much for having me on it's been amazing okay Last Looks crew thanks for listening and remember if you love it share it a quick scroll down and you'll find our show notes or maybe you'd like to give your support and leave a five star review go on Search The Last Dogs Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, whichever one tickles your fancy. And a massive shout out to the husband, Brett Stanley. Without his patience and tech support, this whole podcast situation simply does not happen. And cheers to Liliana Rose for her fabulous voice acting talents. Okay, Last Looks crew, that's a wrap for me. I don't need to be told twice to get out of here. So bye. I'll catch you on the flip side. That's a wrap, people.